What's good? It's Wood. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you were into the fight talk. I wanted to do a quick kind of a legacy review for Tyson Fury, the Gypsy King, as we lead into his uh, title defense against Dillian White. I feel like Tyson Fury, his um, career, his legacy, his reputation is one of the more uh, debated ones. And you have a couple different camps in terms of how they perceive uh, Tyson Fury career-wise. So I wanted to get into it, not necessarily like a fight-by-fight -fight resume review, but more so just a high level, where would you rank him among the greats? at least at this point, and what criteria are you using to, to basically grade them? And so let's get right into it. Now, one of the things that I don't want to get too uh, deeply into is his uh, history with the British Board of Boxing. You could look that up. He had a um, suspension um, back in like 2015, 2016, basically after he beat Klitschko around the same time he was already uh, declared medically unfit and he had taken the hiatus. So the suspension was technically uh, served during that same period as he was being investigated uh, because of his increased levels of nandrolone, which he pretty much attributed to eating uncastrated wild boar. It's a it's a complicated investigation and, you know, him and his family were cooperating with the investigation and it ended up being prolonged to where it was later resolved. And so I don't want to get into that as it pertains to this particular legacy review. I want to get into his actual fights and fights that probably could have but didn't happen, unfortunately, like his, you know, it would have been a fight against uh, David Hay. This would have been like a 2013 fight against David Hay. So this would be after Tyson Fury was, you know, on the come up beating fighters like Kevin Johnson, uh, Steve Cunningham, who uh, famously dropped Tyson Fury in that fight, but Fury ended up stopping Cunningham. He was going to fight David Hay shortly after that. We're talking about 2013. So this would be after David Hay lost via decision to a long time champ Vladimir Klitschko and the fight was canceled twice between Fury and David Hay the first time because Tyson Fury sustained a cut in sparring he had to get a few stitches and then it was um, canceled the second time because David Hay pulled out due to a shoulder injury which he declared to be like career threatening so that fight never took place but I feel like that would have been a key box to check on the come up leading to Tyson Fury's uh, challenge against Vladimir Klitschko, the long time, you know, WBA, IBF, basically everything but the WBC champion for the better part of a decade because the only other champion was his big brother, Vitaly, Vitaly Klitschko, holding the WBC belt for much of that decade. Other key fighters that, you know, Tyson Fury beat before winning the belt and then taking the hiatus, beating Vladimir Klitschko, you know, actually doing it in Klitschko's backyard of Germany. I know the Klitschko's a Ukrainian, but Germany was like their uh, kind of adopted town. That's where they had most of their fights. That's why... The Klitschko's, Vladimir in particular, didn't really resonate too greatly with the American public is because he was fighting in Germany for most of his fights. The feed looked a little bit foreign just in terms of the grainy quality as it was being broadcast to us. Plus, the fight was taking place like early, you know, noon, 1 o'clock p.m. in the daytime. So, yeah, a lot of Klitschko's key fights weren't even watched by most American boxing fans. I mean, I was watching them, but I was kind of like a boxing geek even then. But leading up to that title challenge for Tyson Fury against Vladimir Klitschko, he did beat Derek Jasora twice. First time via unanimous decision in 2011, and then three years later, he beat him via a 10th round stoppage. This was 2014. And, you know, in a lot of these fights leading to the title and then the way that he fought Klitschko in that title bout... We had already seen a variation of styles. We'd seen him fight on his back foot. We saw him start coming forward against Derek Chisora in the rematch. We seen him fight aggressively. We seen him fight passively, switching from orthodox to southpaw. Not to mention his impossible dimensions of six foot nine. I mean, remember back in the day, you would occasionally get like a uh, Lance Goofy Whitaker, somebody who was just totally oversized. You know, like a Sebastian Fundora in the 154 pound division. But you know, usually those super tall projects wouldn't work out too well. They would be okay, but not that great. I guess an exception would be uh, Nikolai Valuev. He was a pretty good heavyweight champ and was, you know, greatly oversized. You know, I mean, he looked like a giant in there. Well, Tyson Fury, six foot nine, was exhibiting a lot of the sweet science techniques that you would usually get from like a cruiserweight or from like a small heavyweight. 
Even more so if you talk about like his use of footwork, his use of angles, his fainting. He just basically had a lot of subtle techniques and a lot of, you know, agile physical gifts that allowed him to do things that people even four to six inches shorter than him were not able to do. Makes for a stylistic matchup, which kind of will allow me to kind of parse this discussion for just a second. When I look at Tyson Fury's legacy, I look at both what he actually accomplished in the ring, just his actual fight by fight, you know, resume. And then you could talk about the matchups where if you were to hypothetically take the great heavyweights from all the different eras, put them into a tournament or like a draft or something, who would you pick first to beat most of these other guys? One of those scenarios. I think that the answer to those two different questions will give you two different answers in terms of how he ranks among the heavyweight greats. Like resume wise, it does not stack up. Like even his road to the title, there were a couple guys where he probably should have faced on the road to the title that, you know, that he didn't, not necessarily through any fault of his own, but okay, once he earns the title and upsets the great champion Vladimir Klitschko, takes his WBA, IBF, WBO, and ring belts, you know, that's when he goes on that three-year hiatus. And that three-year hiatus cannot be like overstated because three years in the prime of a fighter's career is so monumental. Like you remember Andre Ward and uh, Mikey Garcia, when they had their contractual disputes with their respective promoters, they were out of the ring for like roughly two plus years. And it seemed like a lifetime in the career of a fighter. They obviously came back and did some great things. And then when Muhammad Ali was banned for three years due to his refusal to partake in the Vietnam War. So when he came out of that, he was already a different fighter. He never recaptured the same like fleet of footness that he had when he was young Cassius Clay or even when he was newly named Muhammad Ali. When he was beating like the Cleveland Williams of the sport. He was just showcasing a type of footwork that was sort of unprecedented for somebody, you know, his size at the time. He was like 6'3", which was a pretty tall heavyweight in those days. But when he came back, he was still a he still turned out to be a great fighter and had his most iconic moments, really, when, you know, after the ban, basically post-physical prime. But if you look at his style of fighting, he was much more like back against the ropes, a little bit more flat-footed, a little bit more, you know, he was getting hit a little bit more cleanly more often. Still a great defensive fighter in most cases, but no, he had a lot of wars beyond that point. And he obviously fought probably well beyond where he should have. But when you look at Tyson Fury after beating Vladimir Klitschko in 2015 and not returning to the ring until 2018, think about that. And that was his like late 20s going into the early 30s. You don't get that time back. And then, you know, he spent the next year basically for the next two fights before the Deontay Wilder fight fighting, you know, lesser fighters, Sefer Safari and Francisco Pianeta, like virtual no names in the heavyweight division. And then he has that controversial draw against Deontay Wilder, split decision draw. That was the one where he, uh, he was winning, at least to our eyes, most of the viewers eyes winning most of the rounds, got dropped once in like the eighth round, I believe, recovered, and then got dropped again in the 12th round. And that was the iconic get up from the knockdown where he looked like he was splattered and out when he got dropped that second time. Like I'm watching the fight. I'm looking at Deontay Wilder's celebration. The whole house that I'm watching the fight at is just going crazy. Like, oh my God, Deontay Wilder, you know, came from behind, rallied and knocked him out of the 12th. And then he gets up. Like, Time is going to slowly erode, perhaps, what that was like and what that was when it happened. But that was a unbelievable, or should I say unbelievably unexpected rise from that knockdown to beat the 10 count. And even Pauli Malignaggi said, hey, props to referee Jack Reese for not stopping the fight, just waving it off when he saw the state of Tyson Fury for the first like four to five seconds of the count where Fury was just on his back. You know, some refs might have waved that off and we would be talking about the knockout win for Deontay Wilder. Well, Tyson Fury beat the 10 count. Jack Reese allowed it to go to a count as he should have. And so that ended up being kind of an iconic fight that was later overshadowed, prop maybe, by the second and third fight, which, you know, the second was the brutal beating of Deontay Wilder at the hands of Tyson Fury. That was probably the scariest I've ever seen Tyson Fury look in the ring, just in terms of having all the tools. He was showing some of that subtle footwork where he would do the little 
you know, foot faints. And I discussed this a little bit in the in in my uh, Fury versus Dillian White preview. But you know, some fighters will faint with their hands before they throw a punch. They'll faint with their head, faint with their shoulders. They'll faint at the waist, trying to draw a reaction or to get you off rhythm. Fury is so good, and he was in the second fight as well against Deontay Wilder, where he's able to faint with his feet, actually kind of do like a little jab step and then throw like a, a, a jab, or to do like the little jab step and then whip a right hand. He's able to do things at 6'9 with that type of footwork that just makes for a nightmare of a problem. So he mixed some of that nuance in and then his uh, you know, angle changing and so forth, other feints. I mean, obviously he does the head feints that he was doing against Vladimir Klitschko through like much of the first half of the fight. Tons of head feints, kind of hand feints, but he was mixing the sweet science back foot game, footwork mobility game against Deontay Wilder with the come forward, use your uncharacteristically high weight. He was 270 something in that second fight with Wilder. He was much less than that in their first fight, but he was weighing on him, bullying him, taking him to the, you know, walking him back into the ropes, leaning on him, putting all of that weight on the, you know, uncharacteristically high for Deontay Wilder in that particular fight, 230 plus. Wilder's usually in the two teens high two teens, 220s, a little bit heavier in that one. But Fury's weight became an issue there too. And he was just doing all kinds of dirty boxing, and which he mixed in much in the third fight as well, where he stopped Deontay Wilder. He stopped Deontay Wilder in the seventh round when uh, Mark Breland threw in the towel in the second fight. And then he knocked Deontay Wilder out in the fight of the year for 2021, knocked him out in the 11th round. Now, those two wins are huge. And then the, even the split draw was a great fight, a legacy builder, if you will. Because Deontay Wilder's uh, reputation, I mean, he was the bronze bomber, knocking out all of his opponents. I mean, the only one fight that he didn't score a knockout was the fight that he won his belt against Bermain Stavern, and then he knocked Stavern out in the first round in their rematch. But in the first fight with Stavern, Wilder was actually showing some improvement in terms of being a technical boxer. I don't know necessarily what happened to that course. I don't know if he got happy with that right hand and fell in love with it to where he started to abandon some of the growth that he was showing with his jab and so forth. But yeah, Wilder, however the story ends up being told because of the losses to Fury, History kind of does that once you see a fighter start losing, but you should never forget what the odds were. That's why I always look to the betting odds. Sometimes it serves as a good reminder to show you, no, 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 this was a who the hell knows what's going to happen type of fight. If you have a question about what the perception, what the public sentiment was going into a particular fight, look at that fight's betting odds and you might reset your recollection of that. So those wins over Deontay Wilder are huge for Tyson Fury. Deontay Wilder was a WBC champ for over five years. So that is the probably the greatest accomplishment of Tyson Fury's career, his handling of that trilogy against Deontay Wilder. If not that, then, you know, that win over Vladimir Klitschko to first secure those titles. But if there was a criticism of Tyson Fury, or legacy-wise, I would say, remember I was saying that it's two different questions that we're asking. Where, where are you matchups-wise? Matchups-wise, yes, a 6'9 guy that could box and now is showing a different type of power, especially with his right hand under the tutelage of Sugar Hill Stewart and the Kronk Gym. Yes, this is a absolute nightmare. And whether you put him in the Joe Lewis era, the Sonny Liston and Muhammad, Cassius Clay era, the later Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, Frazier era, the Mike Tyson era of the mid to late uh, 80s, the early to mid 80s, late 70s, early to mid 80s era of Larry Holmes, the Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis, Riddick Bow eras of the early 90s to mid late 90s. I don't care where you drop him off. On the timeline of history, he's going to be a problem. And he, maybe some of these guys beat him. Maybe Ty, Mike Tyson finds a way to get on the inside. And, you know, maybe Lennox Lewis is able to use his 6'5 height and kind of jab with Tyson Fury and end up landing a big right hand. Maybe George Foreman is able to kind of endure the early, losing the early rounds and to kind of walk Tyson Fury down and to just bludgeon him with his otherworldly power. Maybe these things happen. But maybe they don't. Maybe Tyson, you know, we'll never know how those things would stack up. But I would put Tyson Fury and give him a good shot against any of these guys. I really would. Probably including one or two of the Klitschko brothers as well. And I know he beat Vladimir, but that was an aging Vladimir. So I don't know how he would do against Vitaly Klitschko, but... I look at his matchup issue in terms of just looking at the styles and the skills of the heavyweight and then ranking them based on that. 
he would rank higher there than he would on accomplishments, hands down, because with the accomplishments, the problem is we have been wanting to see, or at least I have, but haven't gotten a chance to really see how he would do against those, you know, the non-top three. Because for a while in the post-Klitschko era, the top three were seen to be, you know, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, or however you want to put that. Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, or flip the second and third. However you see those three. But right on the outside looking in, you had, you know... Joseph Parker, you had Luis Ortiz, you had Dillian White, you had Alexander Povetkin, you had uh, Andy Ruiz. Um, more recently, you've got like, you know, the Michael Hunters, the Philip Hergovich, um, even though some of these guys are more, you know, untested than others. Um, Alexander Usyk now, obviously, but you, you had a lot of these, you know, kind of r rank number four through number eight, number nine heavyweights that we never saw Tyson Fury get in the ring with. Well, this fight against Dillian White is going to solve for some of that problem. Because if you look at any of the GOAT heavyweights or the GOATs in any division, what are some of the commonalities? One, they have beaten a few A-level fighters. Not one or two, but a few A-level fighters. They've beaten a few A-minus level fighters. And they've beaten a whole hell of a lot of B-plus fighters. They've, they've whooped a lot of ass, right? Tyson Fury hasn't, you know, done so much of that. He has, I would say to his reputation and his legacy, he has risen to his greatest performances in the greatest moments, the most high profile, the biggest pressure moments when you've got to come in in the ninth inning and you got to deliver when the lights are the brightest and the chips are down. Tyson Fury's been your guy. He has come through with flying colors passing each one of these tests. But he hasn't fought enough of those top-level contenders to really put him in with like a George Foreman, a Joe Frazier. Sure not like a Joe Lewis. You look at, I mean, the volume of fights was just way different, you know, in the 60s and before. They were just fighting a ton, you know, especially when you talk about the 50s, 40s, 30s and stuff like that. So it's apples and oranges in those comparisons. But the volume simply isn't there. You know, he, to me, accomplishments-wise, he fits more where the Mike Tyson would, which I don't put Mike Tyson right there with uh, George Foreman, Joe Lewis, and some of those heavyweights. I put him a couple tiers below. He, he had a dominant run leading up to his title gathering in the late 80s up until the time he lost to Buster Douglas in like 90, 91. And obviously he had a campaign in the mid 90s as well when he beat, uh, but he was beating guys like, you know, Peter McNeely, uh, Lou Savarisi. He did beat, you know, uh, Buster Mathis Jr., uh, Bruce Selden on the night that Tupac was killed in Vegas but Tyson Mike Tyson's accomplishments I mean he was beating like the you know contenders of the day you know the quick tillers Marvis Frazier uh Mitch Green um he beat Trevor Burbick for the title beat like Pinkland Thomas Tony Tucker Tyrell Biggs and old Larry Holmes uh Tony Tubbs you know Michael Spinks he beat some pretty good fighters you know and then he lost and then he never really got back on track had two great fights with Donovan Razor Ruddick um those were brutal fights but resume wise Tyson's resume doesn't stack up with, you know, the greatest heavyweights in heavyweight history. And neither, in my opinion, even though he's still undefeated and he is still fighting uh, Tyson Fury. He is 31-0 with one draw, uh, that draw to Deontay Wilder. Again, this fight with Dillian White does check one of those boxes. Okay, you beat like the fourth or fifth best heavyweight in the game as well as beating like one of the top two, three best heavyweights in the game in Deontay Wilder twice. You could argue three times if you thought he won that draw, which I thought that he did. And, you know, between the first and second Deontay Wilder fights, uh, he fought Tom Schwartz, which was kind of a nobody, stopped him by like the second round. And then he beats Otto Valin, which a lot of people are going to point to. Well, he beat Otto Valin. But again, remember the odds thing I was telling you about? Nobody knew who Otto Valin really was going into that fight. If it turns out he's better than we thought, then OK, that's one thing. But going into the fight, it wasn't seen to be a high risk. Oh, my gosh, he's fighting Otto Valin type of situation. It could just in turn be a win that ends up aging well, depending on what Otto Valin does going forward. But again, this fight against Dillian White will do more to start to further Tyson Fury's legacy. And obviously, if he ends up fighting and beating either Anthony Joshua or Alexander Usyk or both, like 
the, the story is still being written, but as it stands, that is the part that's kind of unfulfilled. And again, a lot of this is because of that three year gap in his career. And simply he's, you know, just been tied to that trilogy with Deontay Wilder. So he hasn't really done too much branching out and fighting those, you know, rank number four to rank number eight dangerous opponents, you know? So we'll see how it is going forward. Again, if we are talking overall abilities and just like you know the tail of the tape and what we have seen with our eyes in the ring yeah i think he is about as good as any heavyweight you can imagine but when it comes to what you actually did throughout your career it just doesn't stack up he's good he's going to be on the list somewhere this is just going to keep him being from like in the top five section of that list you know the last three wins that he had leading up to his uh, title contention against Vladimir Klitschko were uh, Christian Hammer, Derek Jazora for the second time, and Joey Abel. So yeah, a, a lot of the you know just opponent by opponent quality over the years makes him a you know great heavyweight. But you, I, I don't think you can call him a GOAT just because the resume does not stack up. And I really think that that matters. Like, you look at some of these greats and, you know, it's like the, the great opponent, great opponent, good opponent, very good opponent, very good opponent. And, you know, sometimes some of these great GOAT even heavyweights will lose a couple of these fights because you're just constantly fighting nothing but, like, some elite or near elite opponents. That just hasn't been the case of Tyson Fury's career. But again, when the chips are down, he has delivered big. And that does help your legacy. But again, if he fights Usyk and beats him and or Joshua, then yes, that dramatically increases your accomplishment level. But yeah, let me know what you think of the uh, legacy of the Gypsy King at least at this point. And let me know what you think about his upcoming fight against Dillian White. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.